You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome back to Mind Over Murder. I'm Bill Thomas. And I'm Kristen Dilley. Hey, I think we got that right. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Sounds pretty good. All right, we've got our roles sorted out, and that's a good thing. In this week's episode, we are teeing up part two of our conversation with legendary FBI profiler James Fitzgerald, who lets us call him Fitz, which makes us feel really good. We're we're in the club. (laughs) We're in the club. We get to talk to a legend and we get to call him Fitz. You probably want to make certain that you listen to last week's episode because this week's episode, we pick up the conversation really essentially midstream. Fitz tells us the story of accompanying a woman whom he calls Laura Crane up to the Albany, New York area from his New York City base. She suspects that her father is a serial killer. If you haven't listened to part one, part two, you're going to be saying, what, where, when? Because the conversation picks up with them heading north to meet with Laura Crane's father, who they call Larry in this version of the story. So you pick up essentially mid-conversation. There was no other way for us to break this fascinating conversation into two parts except to break it into two parts. So does that make sense? And someone uh, said on our Facebook page, why would you leave us on such a cliffhanger? Um, And, you know, that wasn't the goal necessarily. We're glad we could do it. But it was such a a staying in full conversation with Fitz. There was really no way that we could do it other than split it up the way that we did. We do accept the criticism that it was a bit of a cliffhanger. We weren't trying to be cute. It's just that Fitz was telling us this fascinating story and it was long. And he told us it was going to be long. And he was right. So we had no choice except to kind of just cut it in half. So the story just kind of stops. And I know people said, what did you do that for? (laughs) We're really sorry. Now you get part two. It is a fascinating story beginning to end. And just as a reminder, you can read the full version of this in Fitz's Journey to the Center of the Mind, book three. This story is chapter 16, and it is a pretty long chapter. It's well over 100 pages, and you get Fitz's really wonderful, personable, conversational style. So I would highly recommend that if you haven't had a chance to do so, pick up Fitz's book, you know, order it on Amazon. You can also use the audiobook code that he referenced in the last episode. You will not be disappointed. It is a wonderful book. Fitz is such an excellent writer. You just feel like he's in the room with you, talking to you and telling you the story. So you'll get the same kind of experience that we did talking on the phone with him. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you that are scattered around the country, we do urge you to try to support your local bookstore whenever possible. Some bookstores are shut down. Some are doing mail order only. Barnes & Noble and others are also focusing now on their mail order business. So we think this is a great time to be catching up on your true crime and other subjects. Certainly in next week's episode, we'll be talking about True Crime Bookshelf, which I wanted to call Kristen's (laughs) True Crime Bookshelf. She said no. (laughs) Um, I mean, we can, but (laughs) you read just as, well, you maybe don't read as much of it as I do, but you do certainly read it. (laughs) Nobody reads as much as Kristen Dilley. Yeah, Um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I I have to take a backseat on the true crime and and other reading. You're pretty amazing. (laughs) We very much appreciate all the support. We hope everybody's staying safe out there, practicing your social distancing. We all have to take this coronavirus pandemic really, really seriously. As Kristen knows, I'm heavily into the music thing, and we've lost some amazing music people in the last few days. I think all of us just cannot be too careful taking care of ourselves and our families and staying healthy. Yeah, agreed. 100%. So stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands, and keep listening to Mind Over Murder. 
are, are we going to the lake next? And he knew we were going to go to their lake property, the former lake property. So, but yeah, I, I just want to ask you that. I mean, do you remember like bringing, I remember like women in the house. Yeah, I, I had some women in the house and a little boy. Well, I'm not sh- a little boy. I'm not sure. About- Dad, there was a hole in the basement, in the ground. Yeah, I remember that too. And he, he wouldn't say no to anything. And we're listening, but he also wouldn't say, yeah, I killed the women uh, or tortured them or whatever. So so we were close, but not quite there. Next thing, the limo, we go from there up to um, the lake. It's about an hour and a half drive. Sure enough, there's the old property. It's a very rural county in central New York. We go up and we kind of knew in advance where the lake was. We actually found out the lake had dried out. There was a dam built or something and the lake was a a dry uh, lake bed now. And they pull up and yeah, there's the old house. There's the dock. There's no water though. And dad, what used to happen here? We used to come up and you would put things in the water. Yeah, sometimes I would. And Bob and I are listening to this and what the hell? So they wanted to get out and go for a walk. We uh, Luckily, the dad wasn't too bright. And here, I guess I didn't mention this, (laughs) but I'm the limo driver. I'm wearing like a white shirt, a black bow tie. I have like a Jeff cap on my head. I just go by my real name, uh, Jim Fitzgerald. And Larry thinks it's great that this he has a driver. Hey, Jim, uh, you seem like a nice guy. You're kind of quiet, though. Well, that's just me, Mr. Crane. You know, finally we get out and I just go and give her a little tape recorder to carry with her, like in her purse, so they could take a walk around the lake and we can pick up everything there. So finally, they come back in the car, and she's just shaking her head, and and she's confused and, and doesn't know exactly what's happening. We're picking up. He's not denying anything, but he's not admitting anything. We stop and uh, get a bite to eat, and Bob and I sit at one table, and they're over there, so our eyes on them the whole time. So everything's going kind of smoothly. She's kind of frustrated looking out the window on the way back to Albany, and finally, in the last mile... Yeah, it was great seeing you again. I hope I can see you again, Laura. Yeah, we'll we'll see what we can do, Dad. And before the getting, she gets out of the car, he goes, yeah, by the way, um, you remember my nickname back in the days, don't you? Your nickname? Yeah, didn't, didn't you know what my friends all called me? Well, no, what was that? Oh, it was the henchman. Oh, God, that was so creepy henchman. when I read that. <laughs> and you're used to seeing the plural version of that, henchmen, but he made it singular, henchman, and which I thought was odd. He said, yeah, yeah, I always, you know, like to have the axe and I would, you know, carry that around. And yeah, they called me the, the henchman. Okay, so he acknowledged having an axe, oh which of course she saw him chop up bodies. And all of this is coming together. So we get, he gets out of the car. She gives him like a half hug. She gets back in the limo. You know, Mr. Fitzgerald, the limo driver takes off and she is just, you know, I put the, the, the plastic shield down between us. I got to get out of here. I, I I need a shower. I can't do this anymore. This is so frustrating. I, all these memories. So I don't want to say I told you so, but I, I that was I was we were beyond that point. So finally, it's just all right, Laura. I know your flights in you know three hours. Let's get you. I'm not sure I can do this. All right, Laura. That's fine. Let's let's rest for now. We'll take all the tapes. We'll listen to them. We'll see what it is, and we're going to check out tomorrow this hole in the basement thing at the old house. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Drop her off at the airport. She's gone. So Laura's already home, and the next day, uh, Detective LaFountain and I decide to go to the house of this individual where Larry Crane used to live, you know, 20 years before where these murders happened, according to Laura. And we knock on the door. There's an FBI agent and a state trooper, and this middle-class family, you know, comes and looks it out, and FBI and state police, is there a, did I do something wrong? No, no, no problem with you and all. We want to check your house for something specifically your basement. Okay. And your listeners or even you, Bill and Kristen can imagine someone coming into your house and wanting to look in your basement. Seriously, uh, seriously knew, creepy. <laughs> and you know, you're not a criminal. You're not a drug dealer. And of course you, we would have a search warrant if we actually thought there was something, but we just wanted to ask this guy first, if we could look around, he's not in trouble. Well, sure. Okay. So we walk down in the basement and it's an average looking basement of a single home. Um, you know, some parts are nice, some parts are, you know, the washer and dryer and tools against one wall. But we noticed some little holes drilled into the basement wall where like eye hooks could have been to hook someone's arms or legs to them. And they're up about the five foot point where kind of where Laura described them. We noticed some red stuff on the floor, which could have been blood. It also could have been paint. We weren't sure. And we're just walking around with a flashlight. And the guy's with us. And, you know, we insisted he come down with us. And he said, can I ask you guys anything? We really can't. 
a prior owner. Uh, there may have been some things. And again, I'll ask you and your listeners what what goes through your head at this point that you know two uh, law enforcement agencies are here working together, and we're almost ready to leave. I noticed like a big sort of circular rug in the middle, and Bob and I knew there was some kind of a hole or something in the floor. And I said, "Can I look? Can we look under this rug?" So, oh. Yeah, sure. Pull it up and some, we pull it up and some, you know, bugs and everything crawl out from under it as typical in a basement. But then sure enough, what do we see? We see a, a, a cement outline, if you will. It's a cement floor, but then there's a discolored section of cement in the middle, a rough oval shape around three feet by about four feet. It clearly was a hole. It clearly was separate cement work done there. And we asked the guy, this the cement work. This what, this used to be a hole or something. Did you do this? No, that's what was here when I moved here. Do you know what it was? You know, there's no structural elements. There's no heating or or pipes that go neath, beneath it or anything. And Bob and I just look at each other and it's one of those holy S moments because of course we are a clean podcast here. And we say, <laughs> yeah. all right, sir, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. And we go outside and our brains start churning and now uh, we were going to leave later that day, but we said, no, we got to, we got to do something with this. So, um, he contacted some of his people with the state police. I got some FBI people. We went back and we asked the owner so we can get a search warrant if we want, but if you can sign this consent, we promise you, we want to dig up this hole and we will promise you, we will make it exactly as it was before. We'll be very neat about it. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, okay. But can I ask you what may be there? And all we said was, I remember he asked me, he turned to the FBI guy. And I said, Bob, why don't you answer that? <laughs> and Bob yeah. said to me, oh, thanks. Oh, Mitch. oh, sure. Throw uh, it to the state police. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Throw it to the trooper. Well, sir, uh, and we actually kind of rehearsed this before. He said, yeah, uh, there may be evidence of a crime there. That's really all we can say. <sighs> oh, well, okay. I, I, I appreciate that. So we come back the next day and we have a jackhammer and we have tarps we lay down so we don't make a mess of the basement. And we have a couple of troopers with us, a couple of FBI agents. We have shovels, a, a jackhammer, uh, rakes. We have little screens, you know, looking for anything, bone parts, you know, handcuffs, you know, plastic ties, rope, anything. We go down about four feet till we hit water. It wasn't a pipe. It was just you know, the, the water line. Mm-hmm. And it gets a little bit muddy and we're bringing stuff up. And we, and, you know, we decided to do one more foot. We go down about five feet and we found uh, no evidence of anything. So, uh, okay, well, that's interesting. But she never said anybody was buried here, just that this little boy was kept in the hole for a while as a way of controlling him. So we did, in fact, put the basement back together again. And uh, we, the guy asked again, did you find anything? And he was with us in the basement. And I said, no, I, that's good news. Um, we think um, uh, whatever may have happened here in the past was not found in that hole. Will you tell me someday what happened? Yeah, we will. So we leave there. And to come back to this little boy... And I will say this, 31 years in law enforcement, uh, the toughest interview I ever did was what I'm about to relate to you. And of course, it's in the book two. Uh, actually, it's in book three in the book T-O-O. That's the linguist in me, you know. Uh, but it turns out there was a young boy named Doug Legg, L-E-G-G, who went missing in 1970 from his uh, family's picnic in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York. He just walked off from the family one day around three, four o'clock in the afternoon. He never came back. And uh, the details of it, of course, are in the book. But it so happens the family was related to the Rockefellers, uh, who was the governor at the time. And, you know, rightly or wrongly, a massive search went on it, 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 for, for six solid weeks. The boy was never found. They didn't know kidnap. They didn't know uh, fell in a hole, fell in a creek. I mean, there was there was no you know running a river there uh, per se, but just uh, trails that went off to nowhere. It it was helicopters, horses, uh, people on foot, volunteers, you name it. Nothing showed up. So we decided to go interview the leg parents. Uh, they lived in uh, not too far from this area, and Bob and I set up an appointment with them, and we said we want to talk about the disappearance of your son. And we could hear on the phone their 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 voice just said, "Oh my gosh, uh, you know, do you have something for us?" And we said, "No, we don't want to get your hopes up. We just have a little bit of an investigation we're doing." And your son's name came up. We finally drove out to their house. The nicest people, probably in their fifties. They had two older children. They they brought us into their house, and we sat down for a few minutes, and then 
And they said, do you want to go in the other room? We'd set some things up for you. We walk into their spacious dining room and there is basically their war room. They put charts up, they put maps up, they put three different binders of uh, media reports, newspaper articles, police reports, everything you could possibly imagine. Pictures of Doug from back then, age-enhanced pictures of Doug when he was 10, then 15, then 20. And this is now about 22 years after he disappeared. He would have been late 20s at this point, about 30, well, no, about 27, 28. And, you know, Bob and I were, and still are, both parents and uh, with, with young children. And just to have, it, it's one thing losing a child, and I hope none of your listeners ever had to go through that, uh, meaning to death. At least as bad as that is, you have closure, you have finality. But here we have a child who just vanished off the face of the earth. These parents were desperate to find anything. And at one point, there was a three-ring binder that it had a word. It didn't really, you know, other leads or something like that written on it. And I finally said, all right, well, what's this? And they said, um, oh, they're the, uh, they're the psychics we've been dealing with over the years. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they were so desperate as perhaps any parent would be. Psychics would contact them. Usually, I have a vision. Your son is living in a commune of hippies in Northern California and, and someone else, uh, I have, uh, in a family, uh, you know, in Southern Utah and, you know, all over the country, then they would go hire private investigators, pay them to search into these hippie communes or, you know, uh, Mormon, uh, you know, uh, outpost or something, uh, or anything just to find their son with these age enhanced photos, whatever. It, it was just, it was just very, very frustrating for them. And they were so hoping Bob and I could give them something, but we said we're not there yet. But what we did bring with us was a list of all the volunteers that showed up. And that's an old, when people, someone's missing, you're looking for bodies or missing people, you always want to record the names of the people that show up besides just law enforcement. So we had a list and we knew on that list, probably should have said this earlier, but here Larry Crane was one of the people who searched for this little boy over a few days back in 1970. And of course, as a profiler, we know that violent offenders, you know, sometimes will inject themselves into an investigation. And here we have Larry Crane injecting himself into this investigation, perhaps innocently or perhaps because he knew where the boy was and he knew he was nowhere near that campsite, maybe in a hole in his basement. We knew it wasn't there, but certainly somewhere else. And it turns out, so we, we run Larry Crane by them. We, we go down this list of a bunch of names. Oh, I remember Joe. I remember Bill. I remember, you know, uh, Sally. Uh, I, don't remember, I don't remember that person. No, I don't know that person. Oh, uh, and like the third page, you know, the, the 50th name we run by them, Larry Crane. Oh, honey, that's your uh, second cousin, right? <laughs> now the Cranes are related <laughs> to this little boy. And Bob and I, again, look at each other with that holy S moment. And and now things are slowly coming even more together with this, certainly circumstantially. We don't have the case built yet, but a lot of little pieces of the puzzle are coming together. So the, the Leg family offered us to stay to dinner, but we were very, they said, oh, we don't want to bother you. Please, please, you don't know Agent Fitzgerald, and, and uh, it was actually Sergeant uh, Fountain at this point, he was promoted. You don't know what it means to us just to have you here and And the other two siblings came over and we had a very nice dinner with them, talked about other things. What's it like being in the FBI, state police? We were the first police contact they had in about 10 years. No one's reached out for them. The psychics did, but no one from the police, because quite frankly, there was nothing else to offer them. We left that house and it was a tough ride back to the hotel. And we had a few beers that night saying, boy, I, I, I couldn't imagine being in their situation Moving things ahead, the winter time kicks in, and and Laura is fed up. She doesn't want to write to her father anymore. Doesn't want to. It doesn't want to call him on the phone because he had he could call. They can call a pay phone in the lobby of the bar downstairs. I need time off, Fitz. I just can't do this anymore. Okay, do me a favor. Write one letter to your father, just two pages, and if you're okay, I will write to him afterwards. He'll respond to me. Uh, okay, <laughs> I guess so. So she sends a letter to me. Uh, I take it and I postmark it in an envelope from New York City and she types it. So it's computer generated. So I don't have to mimic her handwriting. And we send it to her father, Larry, up in uh, Albany. And he writes it and he writes back to the P.O. box we set up. And I'm getting the letter. 
and I do about a half a dozen letters I'm writing as her. Fitz, can I ask you a question here? At this point, had you studied linguistics to the level that you you ultimately have where you I know you became quite an expert in language. Had that was that part of your skill set by this point? No, and remember this is before Unibom. So I never even had, you know, uh, the manifesto and, 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 and the various, you know, Kaczynski uh, documents and all to look at. No, I'd always been, as I, I wrote my book, I've always been a language aficionado. And uh, between readings, of course, I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm always reading, but certainly applying Scrabble and doing crosswords and cryptograms. And, and gender and language always interested me sort of as a, as a pastime. But no, by no means, I had a master's in, in psychology, but, uh, you know, and some male, female, you know, sociological, psychological issues to be discussed and differences and what have you, but by no means an expert. But all that I had was Laura's first letter to him. And of course, I had the tapes that I listened to. So I kind of had her speaking style down in at least one letter. And all I had to do was type the letter. So I wasn't trying to match her signature. I just like scribbled at the bottom. I typed out, love daddy. And like a scribble, like, you know, Laura, and, and, and he didn't make it any, any big deal out of that. But we were pen pals, and it was the, one of the oddest parts of my life where I guess for an hour each day, I self-identified uh, as a 29-year-old woman at this point, right. writing to my father. Right. And uh, it was odd, but I, I just borrowed from her language skills, uh, skill set her language tendencies and her writing tendencies. And he, um, he had no issue uh, with it whatsoever. He was convinced he was writing to his daughter, and uh, and I was of course writing back to him. He had no idea it was Jim, the limo driver, <laughs> who was actually writing <laughs> to him, or drug limo driver to be more accurate. So yeah, so that went on, and and Laura basically said, I don't want any more parts of this. I said, Laura, please, one more trip. We have an idea up at the lake. One more trip in the limo, two hours at most. We have an idea. She agreed to do it. So it was about July of ninety three. What we decided to do is we decided to, uh, the lake was already drained, but we decided to bring a construction crew in with some heavy equipment. We were going to dig up the bottom of this lake. And this lake was probably a couple hundred yards long by maybe a hundred yards wide. It wasn't giant. Larry pointed out the deep part of the lake when they took the walk around it. And that's where he would dump stuff off the rowboat, he told her. So we focused on that area, heavy equipment, dug it up, uh, started on a Monday morning, and we had screens up there, everything we needed, and we found bones. We had a, we had a uh, PhD anthropologist which, uh, with us who had studied bones, animal bones, human bones. He, you know, he was a, an expert in, uh, in anatomy. So he was there with us from the FBI and, uh, and looking at you know, animal bones, animal, animal, everything we found, no body parts. There was a part of the lake that didn't completely drain. So we brought in a scuba team, nothing there. We walked down a couple hundred yards to the stream where there was running water still and no, no body parts to be found. But here, our cover was blown. We kept this top secret this whole time. All of a sudden, a news van shows up alongside the lake. Oh, man. And they, they, they pull us over as we're leaving because Bob and I were leaving to get Laura that night. The other agents and troopers were still digging. And this woman uh, reporter runs up with a microphone and a cameraman. You're the FBI and the state police. Is it true you're looking for body parts of a, of a serial killer? And is it true that Doug Legg may be here? Oh, my God. Oh, How man. did this get out? Uh, no comment. No comment. And, and I let the state police and Bob kind of run with it. And he just said, you know what? Uh, no comment for now. There may be a press conference we'll have in a few days because we didn't want to blow anything with this because we had a master plan in work uh, for the next day. But we go home, we go back to the bar that night. We pick up Laura at the airport. We're sitting having dinner and there on the TV news at I think 10 o'clock. Front story, first story is... The FBI and the state police are digging up a lake in Lewis County, and they think they have the remains of Doug Legg. The little boy went missing in 1970. We got to call the parents, so we get right on the phone with the parents. Luckily, they weren't watching the news. Sorry about this. And by parents, I mean Doug Legg's parents. Sorry about this. This news broke. We don't know how. There's no guarantee we're going to find anything. And, uh, oh, that's okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
So back the next day, they're still digging, they're looking for stuff. But here was the master plan. The master plan was to have the limo with us again, which of course we did. Laura would go to the bar one last time to meet her father. She would get him and they would drive up to the lake with all the police cars, the media. Now the media, they weren't even planned on being there, or we didn't have that in our plan. We also have, of course, the, the, the construction equipment. And we want to see Larry's reaction when we go by the lake and there it's being dug up. So sure enough, we go up there, an hour and a half drive or so. We get out. They're having this casual conversation. Sure enough, she looked, she knew what, what to expect. You know, we pull up there and I'm listening on my earpiece. Dad, that what's going on? The lake, look, it's, it's, it's being dug up. Police, uh, the TV stations. Well, well, dad, are they going to find stuff? Well, they might. Well, well dad, dad, I mean, well, are you scared? Nah, not really. And I mean, the conversation's kind of going like this. He just wouldn't commit. And But dad, I have to ask you, and we're now back in the car. Dad, I have to ask you, didn't, didn't you, those women we talked about, those women in the basement, didn't you hurt them? Didn't you take their body parts up there? Well, I may have, Laura. Dad, you may have. That's not enough. I need to know what you did, how you did it. And he just wouldn't admit to it. He just wouldn't say anything more. And it was the longest ride back, you know, dead silence. She's just looking out the window. He's looking out his window in the back of the limo, dead silence. And finally, we pull in front of the place and he knew somehow he upset his daughter. They get out of the car. Well, Laura, will I see you again? Yeah, whatever. I'll write you a letter. And like a little half hug. He leaves, goes back into the bar. She's in the car. So I never want to see him again. I'm done with this. I've done everything I can do. Okay, Laura. And I need that shower. So, uh, But I should have waited till she went to the oh airport, flew back to her husband, and, uh, and resumed her normal life. But we weren't done. <laughs> Bob and I, I <laughs> we got in his trooper car, unmarked, of course. And, and with the husband, who was an FBI agent, the fake husband, I mean. And the next day, we knocked on the door, we, and he wasn't there. Larry, we uh, found him walking down the street. And uh, Larry, we're going for a ride. Oh, uh, I'm Bob, Sergeant LaFountain, State Police. And uh, I put out my credentials. Yeah, I'm Special Agent Fitzgerald, FBI. Oh, hi, Jim. Does, does the FBI know you drive a limo, too? <laughs> and I almost unbelievable. Kind of <laughs> at each other. Uh, Mr. Crane, just uh, just get in the car, please. And um, so Bob's driving. I'm in the back. And what's going on? I said we have to talk to you about some things. Okay. What about though? Is, is this about Laura? Yeah, it is. Is she okay? Yes, she's okay. All right. Um, well, okay, I'll talk. So we didn't want to take him in the FBI office or any state, state police building. Uh, we didn't want to have to read him his Miranda rights. And if someone's free to go at any time, you don't have to read them their warnings. So we found, we decided to go to a park bench along a lake. It was a different lake. This one had water in it. And we interviewed him for about an hour and a half. He wouldn't admit to anything about killing any women or the little boy. But we finally got him to admit he sexually assaulted Laura numerous times. Uh, back in the day. We already knew, Bob and I already knew the statute of limitations meant he could not be charged. That may be changed now in some states, uh, but certainly back then he couldn't be charged, whether he knew that or not. He said, yeah, I did some things with her in the basement. And I said, "Um, but you were talking to her about the henchman and things you did with an ax and you never denied it. And all he would say was, you know, I so like being with my daughter again. And it seemed like she got pleased and excited when she would, uh, when we would talk about these women, uh, but, and I tried to give her what she wanted, but I wasn't going to lie to her. I never actually did hurt anybody like that, but I know I hurt her and, and, and that was wrong. And I'm, I'm a bad father and a bad man. And, and Bob and I, again, are just looking at each other. All right. All right. We go back in the car and before um, we get out of the car, he looks at me, I'm still in the back seat with him. Uh, Jim, you know, he knows me better as a limo driver than an FBI agent. So fine, Jim. Um, one question, Laura, was that really my daughter or someone else? I said, wow, clever enough. He, he assumed this could have been like an undercover person. And I said, that was your daughter, Laura. Oh, 
I have a feeling I may never see her again, but, but do tell her I love her and, I, and I'm sorry. Okay. Um, last thing, Larry, can we come up into your apartment and look around? Sure. So we signed a consent form. No problem. Nothing at all there. We were hoping to find, you know, uh, not body parts or anything, but maybe a diary or, or a newspaper clippings of missing the missing Doug leg or whomever. Nothing. After walking out the door, at the last minute, Bob LaFountain remembered, oh, by the way, your house over in uh, so-and-so where you lived, uh, you know, back in the 60s and early 70s, yeah, there was a uh, hole in the, the basement, and it was covered over with cement. In fact, your initials were in them, LC1963. Folks, sorry, it's in the book, but I forgot to mention that in the podcast. So we knew Larry Crane carved his initials in 1963 into that cement, which of course tied him into, and he was on the other owner of the house. So we knew all along, he's the one that dug that hole for whatever reason. And here all it turned out, there was some kind of an oil tank or something on top of it that he converted to gas or something else. He had to move the tank and it went down like a foot, the base of it. And he just put cement on top of it and put his initials in it, but it was never actually a hole. It was just about a foot deep at most. And he just patched that over. And why do you ask? Oh, never mind. Just oh curious, Larry. So to, to bring this to summary, I know we've gone on kind of long here. And, and I, thanks for your patience. And Larry's, there actually is sort of a, I don't want to say happy or even positive, but there is sort of some closure that came out of this. And the summary of it is we never invited the press to this big. They finally, uh, the state police finally had a news conference in which They said, you know, we're looking for possible body parts from earlier homicides. We're not going to confirm and deny, you know, Doug Legg, but he's, you know, he's one of the people that may be involved in this along with others. So there was a lot of media coverage of it, but of course it went, it went nowhere and it kind of died away. I went back to New York, Bob went back to Albany and we assumed our respective cases. Here about a month later, Bob gives me a call and says, Jim, you're not going to believe what call I just got. I said, tell me. And again, I'll summarize it here. But apparently in 1970, there were a couple of guys in the U.S. Navy. They were assigned to some someplace somewhere in New York City or, or New York State, and they had a weekend off. But they weren't allowed to go more than like 25 miles from their base. But this one guy really wanted to go hunting, and he knew a great hunting place. It's a state park up in the Adirondacks. So they cruise up there, and this is like 70, late 70, uh, early 1971. They cruise up there, and they're going out of the area they're allowed to be, and they go hunting. They split up. One of the guys goes in this dark, deep trail, and it's daylight and all, but he's going back and back. He, you know, a switch here, a switch there, jumps over a creek, and he comes around a bend, and he pushes some bushes aside, and what does he see but a mini skeleton? The skeleton... Of, of a child, or certainly a very small adult, and he looks at it, and it's skull, there's some ripped clothing, and he gets scared. And he just follows the trail back, and he's like, you know, a good mile away from where the car was parked in these, uh, in these deep woods. He meets up with his friend and says, you're not going to believe what's back there. What? A skeleton. And he relates it to his friend exactly what he saw. And they say, you know, Joe, forget the exact names, to Bill, we can't report this because we're going to get we're going to written up on charges and court martialed. Right. You know, we're, we're fifty miles away from where we're you know the the boundary line of where we're supposed to be. We've got to keep this a secret. Someone else will find it. They'll, they'll know what to do with it. Sure, okay. So they go in complete silence for twenty three oh, some years. All of a sudden, one of them was still living in the Albany area. They lost contact with each other. He sees all this media coverage of a Doug Leg. He realizes where exactly the park was, because now this is all hot in the news again. He calls his friend who now lives in the Midwest. Joe, remember that body you found that day? Yeah. A little kid. Well, yeah, it was a small person, something. The state police are looking at stuff. It's still unsolved. The parents never knew what happened. This guy, Joe, from the Midwest calls Bob, the state police. The state police fly him in. They, uh, they interview him. They believe him. He's telling the truth. He's not going to be court-martialed now. He's long as the military. And he agrees to go with them to those woods. It hadn't really changed much. And they walk in. He goes this trail, that trail. He goes back exactly where he thinks the body was. 
he doesn't find anything. They had a state park person with them who had worked for, you know, 20 years there. He was on the search and they said, look, there's been floods here. There have been the ground movement. There's been, you know, little mini landslides. A lot of things could have happened since then. But I don't think the part where he walked us to, I checked the old grid maps. I don't think anybody searched this back in the day. So this may have been where the body actually was laid to rest. We eventually called up the leg parents. I think Bob actually went to visit them and he said, look, we can't give you a body, but here's what we have. I believe this guy 100%. He has no reason to lie after 22 years. We think Doug's remains are in this general section of the woods. And you know what? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Leg thanked Bob LaFountain, thanked me indirectly, and said, you know what? We finally had closure. Thank you for this. We've accepted wow. our Doug is dead. We've accepted he's not living in a commune with hippies somewhere. He, he walked off that day, he got lost, and he died, and hopefully he just fell asleep and he was in no pain, et cetera, et cetera. So this whole bizarre investigation, which comes back to repressed memory, we, I'm now convinced that Laura had a case of repressed memory, which was very big back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, a lot of psychologists were pushing that with their, especially female patients, like in their late teens, early to, 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 to early 30s, but they couldn't figure out what some problems were, where was their angst coming from, where was their anxiety, they would start almost kind of convincing them, well, you must have been sexually abused. No, well, I, I don't oh. know. Well, or it could have been your father did something to you, and then somehow we think this uh, psychologist somehow planted in Laura's brain not only the sexual abuse, but then Laura somehow, in her imagination, took it to the whole next level, including the little boy, which she may remember news stories about that. Here indirectly, she was related to this little boy, maybe third cousin, but she never knew that at the time. And all this, uh, all this time and effort on the FBI, state police, not a whole lot of money was spent. I mean, there are these investigations that cost millions of dollars, maybe a few thousand with us, but we did everything we could in this investigation to resolve it. Uh, we tried to disprove Larry Crane being the killer all along, saying, you know, give us evidence it's not him, but they, he would never go away. He kept giving us positive evidence or at least not negative evidence that he could have been this killer of either these women or this little boy. But here, when this all comes up, you know, maybe maybe the interview should never have happened with Laura, maybe this whole case, maybe her, the repressed memory, getting Larry, him still being alive, the media coverage, which we're still not sure to this day how it came about. But because of that, and these two sailors who contacted each other, and they came forth, one of them said, yeah, I saw a body, and we feel there's no reason for this guy to lie. And the parents finally had closure. They're both deceased now, but they could go to bed at night. Of course, not a happy ending, but their son's not out there anymore, and, and get these psychics off their Rolodexes, <laughs> and not to be bothered anymore by them. And this was the whole end of the story. So. I even I even debated writing this because I know it didn't have the sexy ending with aha we finally got the father and here are these missing women and we free them from captivity or something we knew that would be the case but I debated even even writing this chapter because it's not a short chapter if you read it but uh, but I thought <laughs> no it is not <laughs> no but it's a, it's a very and, compelling and, story it really is yeah. And um, me telling it just now is not a short version of it but <laughs> I, I wanted to let the listener and the readers know that. These are where investigations go sometimes. And mm -hmm. can we completely 100% rule out that Larry Crane never killed anybody? Really, technically, no. But we do know he sexually abused his daughter. And we do know the long-term traumatic effects of what sexual abuse on a child can be. And some handle it one way, some handle another. Throw in a psychologist who, at the time, the very trendy, you know, repressed memory scenarios. And, uh, and lo and behold, is Jupiter aligning with Mars all comes together here. It put me in touch with profilers in Quantico. They were helping me through this case at the same time. I was not a profiler yet, but I, I had to know some people. They were very impressed with the work I was doing, the interview reports I was sending them. And it probably, it didn't hurt, open the door for me about two years later when it was time for promotions and they saw what kind of cases I worked, including this one. Again, not with the ending that perhaps we thought would happen, but still how we, we, really, we covered every single lead to the best we could. We came up with some innovative ideas, including the, the drug limo and, and having her recording, having her go to her father herself. Maybe we could have done that differently with another female agent, but maybe he too would have picked up on that somehow if he was suspicious and asked about, you know, old aunt, you know, Sophie or something and, and tricked her that way. So, uh, 
I've done a lot of talking here. Maybe uh, you two have some questions of me at this regard. But uh, but thanks for listening. And this is a, uh, a it was a long drawn case back in the day, covering about two years from the day Charlie Jardines was shot and the day of the interview with Laura to about two years after that when we finally could put this to rest. And of course, uh, the leg parents could find out that just about without a doubt their son died a natural death, so to speak. I mean, in the woods, and uh, and nothing else happened to him. I also learned a few things about how FBI agents work just from this section of the book. First of all, you mentioned something here, and I was really struck by it in reading this part of the book, which is fascinating, that it makes sense for your cover story and your cover identity to be as close as possible to your real story so that it makes it easier to remember. In other words, your name was the very same and, and, you know, you were Fitz and uh, the driver. And so you don't have to remember a complete false identity and a backstory and all of that stuff. Now, obviously he probably wasn't going to be grilling you as the limo driver and he seemed to accept you in that role, but that, you know, you didn't bother to change your name or pretend to be some incredibly complicated character you just you just presented yourself as Fitz the limo driver yeah and that's the first thing we tell our undercover agents of course we have to give them fake IDs and put them in different cities perhaps whatever but we usually try to keep the same first name because you're in a room and someone uh, hey Bill and you don't turn around right and all of a sudden oh that's right that's my name Bill I yeah. quick turn around so you try to keep the same uh, first name but of course you would change last names to get your your backstory going off and yeah, and, and, and that's, we didn't get into this in this story, but if we were going to recruit a female undercover, we actually interviewed a few that kind of looked like, you know, the same build, same hair color as Laura. They said, yeah, I'd be willing to do this. Well, we knew it would take like a, a solid week of hanging out with Laura and getting her family tree, at least the basic stuff down and what school she went to and the neighborhood she grew up in and memorizing addresses and, you know, at least basic stuff. The father didn't grow her too much on that stuff, but there were a few questions he asked about her mother and at least one or two aunts and uncles, things like that. If it was an undercover person, it could have been pretty tricky. And uh, Larry wasn't a dumb guy. He may have had some mental health, you know, issues, but he was certainly functional. He could live on his own. He had some kind of a pension or disability after all these years of uh, whatever he did. So, uh, but yeah, but undercover stuff, uh, it's, it's a good observation, Bill. You do want to keep it as close as possible to who and uh, what you really are. And uh, it, it certainly makes it, makes it easier that way. Well, this is a fascinating case, and the whole entire book is really fascinating. So uh, if our listeners do want to buy your book, can you tell them where they can go to do that? Oh, sure. Um, Amazon's the best place. Uh, it's uh, All three books are there in um, traditional book version as well as ebook version. I've only done the third book so far as an audio book, and that can be attained on, um, on Amazon, but also through freeaudiobookcodes.com to get a free version while they last and won't be there forever. Uh, unfortunately, I can't sign audiobooks or ebooks, but if you go on my <laughs> website, I'll sign your Kindle screen if you want, but that'd be you know, probably kind of dumb. Actually, one person at CrimeCon was actually considering me doing that. I said, no, I'm not going to sign your screen, but uh, she would have a plastic covered over it or something. So, But I go on the, for my website, jamesrfitzgerald.com, and there's ways on Facebook and email and everything else to reach out for me, and I can actually send you signed books uh, around the country, even internationally. It's not cheap to go international with the shipping and handling, but uh, but I, I've sent about a dozen over to different countries so far, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of that. So, uh, so yeah, I do appreciate you uh, you uh, asking that. Your, uh, your listeners enjoyed this uh, investigation re, uh, recap and, uh, and what it's like, you know, uh, in an FBI agent's life. And, you know, I'm interviewing this woman for three hours and all right, but to wrap up my day and then not even go home that night, spending it in the hospital with this uh, lovely bank robber who I think is still in prison as he should be. So, yeah, it's just bizarre how these cases go. But this one, this is the famous Larry and Laura Crane case. Uh, learned a lot from it. You know, I watched the... Um, Real quick here, the podcast, uh, The Keepers. Have either of you watched that? Oh, yes. Very oh, much yeah. So. We're big fans. And I got halfway through and said, boy, repressed memory, repressed memory. I'm a little cautious here, especially I won't give too much away, but one of the people was walked out to be shown the body and all this stuff. And, oh, boy, that sounds a little bit 
I, I do believe what the women said, uh, of course, as things went on. I won't give too much away if other people haven't watched it. But and that, you know, the repressed memory issue was even brought up back then. Yes. Uh, and uh, and of course, it was like the 90s when some of this was first coming to the forefront and uh, early 90s. And um, uh, so I did have some question marks went up. But on the whole, uh, the conclusion of the uh, of that series, I believe, uh, you know, it, it was what it was. Uh, so, um, but uh, yeah, you have to be careful with these things, and uh, and, uh, and and psychology gets gets carried away sometimes with these trends and patterns, and sometimes rightly so, sometimes not. And I think this is a case that we the whole repressed memory thing, if it's, that's truly what it is, has sort of been debunked, and we really need, you know, there there really has to be more of a active memory with other types of evidence to back things up for people to take those types of things too much more seriously in terms of making an arrest or ruining someone's life if that's all we really have from someone at this point. And I, I think that's how it should be. The book is Journey to the Center of the Mind, books one, two, and three. The author is James R. Fitzgerald, who usually lets us call him Fitz. Um, we really appreciate your joining us on, on Mind Over Murder. This has been an incredible discussion. Bill, Kristen, it's been my pleasure. Uh, thanks for listening to me, and uh, let me know down the line. We can do this again sometime. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you in person once we're all freed from our self-quarantine. Yes. Uh, uh, dittos on that one. I'll buy you a quarantini or maybe actually a martini. <laughs> <laughs> quarantini. That sounds great. That's awesome. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.